So, um, I'll just sort of, since I, I think last time maybe some of the things were a little bit fast, I'm just going to summarize really quickly what I hope you remember from last time. And if you have any questions, I can address those right away. So, uh, you try that Okay. So, last time we, um, main thing we did. was to write down an equation for uh, the evolution of vorticity. Okay. We started with an endoscope, and then we wrote down an equation for the evolution of vorticity in a fluid. Where vorticity is uh, the curl velocity field. Okay. And then we took part of the equation, which we understood, uh, and understood it in a, in a way which is kind of physical and easy to, to interpret and easy to calculate. Which is we understood it as a basic, you know, a simple rule, a Helmholtz rule. Okay. Okay. Which tells us that essentially vorticity follows the fluid. Or goes with the flow, if you like. And there's a couple of other laws which essentially express the same thing. There's no, since vorticity follows the flow, if there's no vorticity to start with, there's no vorticity at the end. And then since vorticity follows the flow, if you kind of try to constant, if you have a flow which compresses uh, vorticity in, in a particular region and stretches it out, then the magnitude of the vorticity has to increase. But essentially, all three laws which we wrote down are one law which tells you that the vorticity really follows uh, the flow. So with this simple rule, you can sort of, this is the rule by which you calculate, given a distribution of vorticity in a fluid, how the fluid evolves thereof. Um, now, of course, uh, this has to be supplemented by a simple sort of uh, way of calculating flow from vorticity, but that is very simple, as we saw. It's the same as the basic rule which you use to calculate magnetic fields and curves. So the velocity flowing. is just the inverse curl of the vortices. Okay. So, uh, so the way in which you can essentially calculate the evolution of a fluid is to be given the vorticity at the beginning, from this to calculate the velocity, and to use this velocity to step forward the, the vorticity, and then from that new distribution of vorticity to calculate new velocity, and then you can move the vorticity forward and so on and so forth. And you have a completely closed system. So you can completely characterize the motion of the fluid with basically the knowledge of electromagnetism and the idea that vorticity follows the fluid. So um, we kind of then looked at a couple of examples of this, but a little bit more today. Okay? And the two examples where we sort of looked at to see this core in action were um, sort of uh, point vortices. So we considered uh, a pair, we considered pairs of vortices, really, to see this more in action, and we considered a pair of point vortices in a two dimensional uh, Bose condensate, so a vortex was corresponding to either a point in two dimensions or an infinitely long line in three dimensions, but we had two points with the same direction of vorticity, so they orbit each other, and two points with opposite vorticity. We saw that they moved together like this. Okay. And we could actually essentially calculate what they were going to do, or at least estimate what they were going to do just by inspection. We know that the flow around the vortex sort of goes around it like this. So we know that this vortex generates the flow that points down to this vortex. We know that this vortex does the same, this vortex. So we could immediately, just using a simple rule and this simple inversion, calculate the motion of these two vortices. And we saw a video from a simulation in a, in a Bose quantum gas where you saw the two vortices which were set up like that, and that's exactly what they did. They rotated around each other. And we did the same thing for another pair of point vortices in a Bose gas. In this case, it was plus and what was minus. And we saw that they went, uh, they traveled together in a different direction. And, uh, and then finally, we looked at another example of sort of omega following the flow. 
uh, in this case the flow, not the vortex. That was the example where we took two rings. So we had two vortex rings, one like this and one like this. These rings have all the participants concentrated in this ring. And uh, we followed the flow field around the first ring, like this. Just like the magnetic field around the field of the power flow. And we saw that, in fact, the second vortex ring okay, was transported by the flow generated by the first vortex ring okay, through the first vortex ring. And vice versa. That's just an example where you sort of have a distribution of vorticity, you can calculate the velocity field from it, and from that velocity field you can figure out the evolution of the of the, of the fluid. Okay? And uh, okay. So uh, both those examples are sort of nice because they're the simplest examples you can sort of hook up, and they sort of immediately show you. That these laws can be used in an intuitive way to figure out the evolution of the fluid. Um, but both these examples involve kind of pairs of vortices and the influence of one vortex or another. And so, what I want to do today is kind of try to complete this story by looking at the self evolution of a single vortex. Instead of having pairs of vortices, we're going to consider single uh, vortices. So, first of all, are there any questions about what we talked about last time, as I sort of summarized? Okay. Paul, I think maybe you know, what we discussed is that um, I discussed something with uh, Paul who was here at uh, the end of your lecture yesterday. Do you want to bring that up in the end? Or um, first part? Well, I was wondering a little bit about the um, far field boundary conditions mm -hmm. uh, in for uh, one of these vortices um, and how it might interact with the, with the boundary conditions or how it, how it might you know, topologically exist in a real system. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know how, how to explain, but. Okay, so, so the question about, <laughs> sorry, the question is about boundary conditions? Yeah, in particular for single vortex. <coughs> If you have a single vortex, ah, I see. So you're asking if I have a box like this, and I put a single vortex in here, yeah. right? Then since it's kind of P and everything is long range, um, how could this sort of be topologically compatible with having uh, a boundary? Yeah. Okay. Well, that depends on the boundary conditions. So in the case of, uh, of uh, you know, if you have something like a cloud of those gas or something, you can imagine having a boundary condition where the fluid can slip at the boundary. Mm -hmm. And in this case, you don't really have any problem. The fluid at the boundary can just sort of rotate. Uh, if you have fixed boundary conditions, then you'll have a problem. Uh, so, in fact, I don't really know of, of any experimental realization where vortices in two dimensions in a sort of flat space uh, with a fixed boundary. Uh, I have to think about that. Usually these things in these situations shows up in pairs, in diagrams. Yeah, sure. Cool. Okay, thanks. Um, except, of course, on, on objects with topology like spheres, where uh, you have issues with the boundary conditions and having a pair of isolated works. I'm sure Mark would have a lot of them. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay, so. Uh, Uh, okay, so today we're going to start by focusing on isolated vortices and the motion that they induce on themselves. Example, these examples we consider for one influencing another, and, and now we want to consider one influencing itself. So the uh, uh, simplest example is a point vortex. Into the e, which is called just talking about, right? which is sort of equivalent to a straight line.
Okay? Because uh, this velocity field of E right, is equivalent to magnetic field of E that you would get from the current carrying wire this way, and all of that just rotates uh, around the object. So, uh, this is not a trick question. Can anybody tell me what half this point vortex is going to evolve in time? What's it for? <laughs> so, so if I put another point vortex over here, right? This point vortex will generate a flow like this. So that would move this vortex over here, right? So if I remove this other point vortex, and the flow is all just going around and it's circular. Is there any action? Is there any sort of velocity that's pushing this vortex along? No, no exactly. Yeah, so it just stays there. It has not been added. That's why I said because it's not a trick question. Right? So the point vortex uh, does not move at all okay? in two dimensions. It's only pairs of vortices that control each other. So essentially, in two dimensions, by looking at the two examples we looked at yesterday, a pair of plus minus, a pair of plus plus, we got all the, all the rules. Okay? Um, there is one part that I connect though at this point just to make sure because this, this is sometimes a confusing point. Uh, so, is everybody, let's see, I don't want to make this remark. Um, so, I hope it's a point vortex, right? What do I mean by that? I mean that all the vorticity is concentrated in that point. Or equivalently, if you think about this in 3D in the line which is all over there. Okay? But at the same time, just to know the, uh, the resulting velocity field is a flow that's going around this vortex like this. Okay? So sometimes, some people find it confusing, you probably don't, that, that uh, the vorticity is all over here, which means that curl of V is not equal to zero. Only, sorry, it's, uh, it's only not equal to zero at the origin, and it's equal to zero uh, everywhere else. So, this is just a remark I want to make, even though you have circular, circular flow that circulates around, that doesn't mean that you have vorticity or non-zero curve. Right? And this, uh, the, people find this confusing sometimes, so I thought I would show you a movie, kind of, I found very useful once you see this, hopefully you're never confused again about this. Um, let me see. Camera off. Share screen. Go. I think there's some audio associated with this. Try to ignore it. Okay. So, on the left, uh, I'm going to show you a video on Twitch, which is... It takes a uh, second to come on. Sorry? Uh, it usually takes a few seconds for us to see the shared stuff. Oh. So, ah. Now you see it? Yeah. 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 Okay, so on the left there's a bit of, of a rigidly rotating fluid. Right? So, so the velocity in the case on the left decreases radially from the center. So does everybody know what the, what the vorticity distribution that corresponds to that is? Probably not so easy to figure out if you don't know curl in color coordinates, I'll tell you right away. It's basically uniform distribution of vorticity. Okay? So when it is rotating uh, solidly, you get a uniform kind of distribution of vorticity. And let me show you what happens if you then try to put a little indicator of vorticity in your fluid. Very directly with the rate. Obviously, lines are fixed in a tangential or normal to the streamline will rotate. Just as they would in the vortex filament. Okay, so what you see over here is that the fluid is rotating rigidly. 
if you put a little rod or a little object in this wood, then it rotates. And it rotates because the flow is non-zero everywhere. Right? A little stick or cross is an indicator of the curl. What the curl not being zero means, it tells you that as you move around the loop, right, you, you don't cancel out rotation. On the right, the video I want to show you is a uh, velocity distribution which approximates that of point vortex. So 1 over r flow field, okay? the velocity varies as 1 over r is applied, so the streamlines kind of as circular. And in this case, complicity, as we just kind of said, is to put the zero everywhere except at the core. And so, just to sort of uh, take that back. Can you put the link and that out and put together? This is kind of calculating the curl in an experiment. Okay. It's using a little cross, but you can see that the little cross does not retain the pole. It, it all fits around the vortex, but it doesn't actually rotate Okay. Vortex. The, it's proportional to 1 over the 
the radius, the radial distance from the vertex. And so, what you might worry about is the fact that, well, uh, I need to sort of make sure if, that I don't have any local effects, so that my non local condition of how the vortex ring moves uh, is the whole story. So, how do you do that? Well, we can sort of consider we want to zoom into a particular region. If you zoom into this region over here, have our vortex and sectors the vortex plane over here, what we want to do is we want to calculate the velocity field, which is generated at this time. And what we see when we do that is that uh, at a particular point over here, I calculate the velocity field, and the contribution from, let's say, this segment of the vortex over here, generated like this, but if I go off a little bit, I also have a contribution from a segment of the vortex over here. And if I then go this way, I also get a contribution from a section of the vortex. So, neighboring points, in principle, contribute to the velocity field at a particular point just the So, to, to be sure, or if it's not true, that, that our normal picture captures the full story, we have to worry about the velocity field in the halo of the vortex which is curved. And so, uh, let's have a look. Let's see, let's see what happens. Let's, our, our mission is to calculate the velocity field in the halo of, the, of a set of a vortex which has some. So, okay. So, what well, we sort of know how to do it in school, let's, let's just work it out. So we're going to need just a little bit of machinery here with the center of our calculation. Um, this machinery essentially is a bit of language. It's the language which we use to characterize curves and three dimensions. Okay. So we're going to imagine that we have some sort of arbitrary curve. Okay. And I want to ask about, in this case it's going to be a ring, but why not? general problem in one go. And we want to know how to describe the geometry of this curve uh, locally to this curve. So, um, well, so how we, first of all, we need a parameterization of this curve. So one way to define a curve is to say the points along the curve are found in terms of some parameter, sigma that varies along the curve. Uh, some expression for our curve. Okay, so for example, a circle in the x, y, y would just be r equals r uh, plus uh, zero, and so on and so forth. Um, okay. So we have a parameterization that the first kind of geometric property of the curve is the length. <coughs> and this is just um, the integral uh, along the line of the length of that segment. So it's d modulus. This is really just equal to modulus of the r sigma of the curve. Um, which is which can be a pain to deal with. So every time you want to calculate the length, you have to sort of go and compute this derivative and take its back. So, so in fact, it's convenient to uh, characterize the curve using a parameter that varies uh, in proportion to the length of the segment as you move along the segment. So uh, that this is equal to yep, S. Our S is just something other. We get from our original one. And we can obtain it. So, uh, this is pretty to say if you have a curve, three dimensions, uh, do yourself a favor, parameterize it uh, in terms of its length. Make everything else be measured here. So that's, that's the parameter condition here. Okay, so we have a length. Okay. The next thing which we have is sort of, we're interested in kind of figuring out 
evolution is local picture, so I'm going to be interested in the local shape of the curve. So let's do the simplest thing that I have to do, which is Taylor expectation. So if we consider the, the point on this curve, that's zero. The parameter here is a zero at this point. I want to know how the curve varies in the vicinity of this parameter, of this point. So we just Taylor expect. So we have our point over here. Basically, given by one of radius curvature. 
of uh, sort of circle local fit in the place where you are. Okay. So we can sort of give this prefactor uh, an interpretation, which is the one over local radius curvature. And we have our surface. Okay. Uh, actually, how do we do the time mark? Um, well, we started a little late, so about 25 minutes. Okay. So it makes it makes sense. Okay. So, <clears throat> so this is all we're really going to use for our calculation. I'll just leave it as a comment that you're one step away from. Uh, so the only other thing which, if you're trying to describe a curve in 3D, like for general purposes, not just the vortex dynamics, then uh, all the facts that locally every curve is oh, okay. Um, and so all you need to know no local is the greatest pressure solar circle. The only piece of information you're missing to be able to reconstruct an entire curve is how this will plane the circle torques and rotates as you move along the curve, which is called the torsion. And so with these, uh, and if we work this out, I'll maybe post a couple of notes on this just so you have it for the future. Just by using the same logic, you can add the last of the function which tells you how the circle rotates, and then you have a complete description of the curve, both the description of the curve in terms of its good geometric probability, the torsion, the curve, which is how the plane rotates as you go along, and the curvature. But for the point of view of context dynamics, we don't need to worry about the curvature. So we're going to start here. So, so we have our, our curve in, uh, in 3D. Okay, and the parameter, so one thing that we found is that the this is called this uh, circle. So let's just get a little bit of intuition by looking at a particular shape. <coughs> So let's see. So, okay, so let's consider the circle. Okay. Uh, does that know what the curvature is at a particular point on the circle? Could you repeat the question? Oh, uh, so we have a circle, okay? So what is the curvature at every point on the circle? One over R. <laughs> It's uniform curvature, and every point you have this circle of three. But as it's this shape over here. So, what is the curvature at this point here? I guess that's a silly question because I haven't given you any parameters. Okay? <laughs> the curvature at this point over here is the curvature of this circle over here, for my best 10% over there, which is R. Now I'm going to figure out the curvature at this point over here. Okay. And this will also be R. But because it's on the other side of the circle, uh, it's actually minus 1 over. So what about the curvature at this point over here? Zero. 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 So the radius of curvature is zero, and the curvature is one over zero, which is a ten. Uh, no, sorry, no, the curvature is zero. Uh, the radius of curvature is zero. Uh, radius of curvature uh, is infinite. Because it's basically a strict line. So uh, So let's go and use this description. Figure out what it is. So let's see. So we want to calculate the velocity. This was our mission. Okay? We want to calculate the velocity of the point P in the vicinity of a curve uh, vertex. And we will decide that basically we just worry about the local circle if we're looking at a local description of our curve. So we're just going to approximate for the circle local. 
Okay. Um, so our expression for the capacity of the of x is just the inner server of all, which is the same expression. Our partner minus gamma y gamma is the strength of the product after that we have x minus curve R and S cross E cross N S for So, um, okay, so now we have our local description of our curve. We can expand, we can ask, we can take a particular point on the curve, which is a mean the point that we want to calculate. We can uh, run down our local expansion for R of S. We'll call it that it's going to be R of this. Yes. Okay. 
and B, X, minus B, X, gamma, And the answer you get is the following u x in the limit 
of xp going to the origin of the point is gamma goes to pi x over r squared xp in that minus y over r squared that was our first term, the top line, plus gamma over 4 pi times 1 over minus 0, log 1 2 epsilon over r. This was our second term. Okay. And plus, I'm going to say other terms which are bounded. Both these terms diverge as r equals to 0. We don't have to worry about it. So, the first term diverges as r equals to 0. You can immediately sort of recognize by expansion what it corresponds to. It's exactly the same term which we had in the case of the strict line of the vortex. Right? We said there that the flow field in the phi direction goes with gamma over the radius, so it's just the fact that the velocity has to diverge as you approach the origin, but it's not an issue because all this velocity is tacked in a circular motion around the origin, so it doesn't really affect, it doesn't move your vortex. So this term over here doesn't move our, our filament at all. But what we get in this case is an additional term, and the additional term also diverges as you approach the origin. It's given by this term here. If I'm missing a beta. Sorry. Okay? And, and this term kind of does move the vortex. And this term doesn't just go data around the vortex. This term gives the vortex a definite velocity in the direction of V, right, which is our plane perpendicular uh, motion over here. And uh, it's very, very strong this approach to the origin. It's a divergent term. So what's really nice about this here, so the first thing that we've learned by doing this calculation is that because the velocity field as we approach a vortex filament diverges, then if you have a sort of arbitrary curved vortex filament, not just a simple straight line, then unlike in 2D, you really have to worry about the low location, not just the normal location. So in the case of 2D, we can just worry about the words that's influencing a particular point. In the case of 3D, we still have that, but we also have a dominant term, which is my low location. In other words, you're still moved by your neighboring bits of vortex, if you like, but now these neighbors are infinitesimally close and they contribute infinitely much. So the, the, the picture of vortex evolution becomes a very local picture. So that sort of tells us that we really have to worry about the singularity, and it really influences the lower vortex motion. In fact, it, it kind of uh, dominates. Okay. The nice thing is that what emerges at the end of all this is a very, very simple rule. It's a very simple picture. You can take this equation over here, and it has a very simple interpretation, which is that if you want to figure out the velocity of this point here, the limit that I go up to the filament, okay, up to some track which gets very big, it's proportional to the curvature. It goes with one, so prefactor, which is the strength, is basically inversely proportional to the radius of curvature that protects at that point. And it's always in the direction of the binomial of the movement. Which in fact is a very simple proof. Because now, I can imagine, right, um, if you have a, a vortex in a real fluid where you have viscosity, then in, you have, um, if you have a singularity, like this one over our singularity, viscosity is going to come in and regularize that. So it's going to make our vortex, instead of infinitely thin, it's going to give it a very small sort of thickness delta that comes at that time. This time. So the term is in, in practice, will be not actually infinite. Um, just sort of large. Um, and so what we basically have is a geometric rule for vortex evolution. Okay? So the geometric rule is uh, I give you a curve, an arbitrary curve vortex, 
you locally go and fit a circle at every point in this, in this curve. And the vortex moves at that point in proportional to the curvature of that circle. And this is basically sort of takeaway message from this whole calculation, which is that you, know, you have to worry about similarities. Similarities make your evolution into a local picture instead of a non-local picture, but this local picture uh, gives you the reward of having a very simple evolution. And so, um, <clears throat> so let's consider this right, in the case of a, of a circle. So in the case of a circle, the calculation we did before is we said that the circle over here was going to go into the board. If this point over here moved this point, or if this moved this into the board. Which is correct, but happens not to predict the actual velocity of the vortex, because the velocity of the vortex really, at this point, doesn't come from this point, but it comes from its little neighboring points. Okay. But, still, the same direction, it's still the direction of the divine normal, okay? and it's still, it doesn't proportional to the curvature. So we sort of got the right answer, but for the wrong reasons, and it wasn't quite the right answer, uh, up to a large view. So that's a circle, but right when we set this calculation up, we set it up for an arbitrary curve, which is look at a circle. So as I said just a few ago, we now predict the evolution of, of a curve filament. So let's have a look at a video of a curve filament and see, and just make sure that, that all this makes sense in actual function. So let me take the video off, share screen, start. Okay, so what I want to show you here is a. Uh, oh, can everybody see this? Yeah. Yes? Yes. 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 Okay. So what you're looking at over here is basically the same experiment that you looked at yesterday. Yesterday we pushed kind of water out of a, of a circular hole, right? and we saw, uh, or smoke out of a, a circular hole, if you like, and that formed the vortex, and you saw how it evolves. Now I'm going to push, do exactly the same experiment, but instead of having a circular hole, we have one of these kind of funny-shaped holes, like the one that you see over here. Okay? So let's do the experiment. And this is what you get. So what you can see is that there's a kind of very clean, coherent evolution uh, of this shape. It so almost looks like it's a plastic element sort of oscillating back and forth. Okay? But of course, we know that in fact the way in which we want to understand this is not really in terms of, of, of an elastic object sort of moved in response to force, but it's in terms of, of vorticity being transported. So this concentrate line of vorticity is being transported by the flow it generates. Okay, I'll put it again. Um, and let's see if the rule of derived is an understanding of this motion. Okay. So, remember at the beginning, consider the shape. Okay, whoops. I'm going to try, I don't have a laser pointer, but I hope you can imagine where I'm pointing when I'm pointing. A sec. Let's see here. Um, okay. So if you look at the notes, we kind of looked at the earlier this shape over here, and we saw we, we sort of sketched out what the curvature was at various points uh, along this curve over here. And so at the, the kind of top of this curve, we had a, a small radius of curvature. It was like the, the tightest circle in the problem, and uh, the viral model pointed out towards us, okay, and this was really the fastest part of the vortex because the radius of curvature was smallest. And then as we go around the edge, we found we sort of went to the point where the radius of curvature was infinite, so essentially the speed should be zero, according to our prediction. And then we come kind of down uh, on the right side through this part that's curved kind of backwards. This part over here should move, let's say, backwards a little bit. Okay? And so now, what, what we can sort of do is use this rule to kind of integrate forward the motion of this object and see if we get the right answer. So, if we integrated this forward, what would we get? We would get the top part of this vortex moving faster than the rest of the vortex. So, it's going to come forward and eventually kind of pitch down. The straight segments are roughly where they are, and the segments beneath them are sort of going to come, they're going to lag behind it and sort of come backwards. So, if 
effectively what you should get is a sort of flattening motion, right, where the top part comes down and the side parts come down. And that's, that's sort of a prediction of the calculation that we did today. And so it's sort of that, uh, because we can look at the same vortex from the side, that's exactly what we see. So I'll just play these again. That we whistle there. So you can sort of see that the curved parts, the highly curved parts come forward, the negatively curved parts come back, and sort of this gives this three-dimensional dance to the notion of this vortex that just keeps on kind of finding its own shape uh, after each one of these installations.
Incidentally, for those of you who, who have not taken a look at my next, uh, this is absolutely amazing. It's absolutely amazing that we can calculate and uh, something statistically accurate and go to the video and see that it captures the behavior of that thing. This doesn't happen very often with fluid dynamics. It's a highly the problem. We essentially reduce it to a simple geometric pool. Okay, so uh, this is the syntax. So now what I want to do is I want to go back to our equation. Which is our equation for the equation of elasticity. Okay? And I just want to imagine that we're going to consider a two-dimensional vortex. We're going to consider a vortex where everything is kind of concentrated at the beginning. So I hope the so the first thing that, that happens is that uh, we're in two dimensions. Okay, so two dimensions, we don't worry about this term over here. Because the vorticity of two dimensions always points out at the board. So there's never any gradient in velocity out of the board. This is really a three-dimensional term, so you can get this term over here is just fine, and it's just a two-dimensional Laplacian that otherwise is and this term up here, for the fact that we know that we have symmetry in the problem, okay. in other words, that u is equal to, for well, the velocity, so I can say p, d pi. This is the tragedy of terms of these. So, for the fact that p is equal to p phi, we can consider p dot grad. Uh, term. So remember, d by dt is basically dt plus d dot grad. So from the fact that the velocity is varying only in the phi direction, is, is, is two dimensional, um, you can basically exclude this term point. Because there can be no variation in the uh, velocity okay, uh, along the phi direction. So that term goes away. And then we have a, uh, a B. We have no radial direction, so we have no radial derivative. So D phi, D phi, okay, that's a finite term, but when it acts on D, it has to go to zero because there's no variation of D with phi. And B R, B R is equal to zero because B R is equal. So this term goes over as well. So essentially, what becomes of this equation is d by dt omega squared omega. And you'll recognize this equation. It's nothing other than the diffusion equation. And it's a diffusion equation for vorticity. And so the only important parameter is the diffusion constant, and the diffusion constant is given by the KMI viscosity, which is given over here. And so what does a diffusion equation do? Right? We all know the diffusion equation from whatever system you study that in temperature and fraction of the favorite system is. What the diffusion equation tells you is that whenever you have a concentration of something, Whenever your gradient is large, then uh, distribution must smooth its gradients out. So whenever you have distribution it's initially like this, this is omega, this is R. What the diffusion function wants to do is it wants to smooth it out. So in time, it takes this and smooth this out. And the rate at which it does this you can predict from the diffusion constant. And the diffusion constant, so just, you know, just essentially you can do this by dimensional analysis, after a given time t, okay, your distribution of elasticity is going to have some weight, right? We'll call it L. 
So I find T driven supply. <coughs> I went to L as driven supply. And our viscosity mu has units of what? Omega on both sides cancels. Here we have D by D, so the left hand side is not the T. This is 1 over L squared. So the units of mu of mu must be L squared for the T. So this is L squared T. So with these three, there's only one dimensionless combination, which is the L, L squared, the mu T. So this width L over here is proportional to the square of the L squared. In fact, if you like, you can sort of uh, sit down and solve, uh, solve the problem exactly as you think. What the final is going The velocity uh, is equal to r times gamma. Right? Then you can translate this equation and solve it and solve the gamma. This is gamma r p. is equal to the norm, your initial vortex strain, 1 minus T minus x squared of the power of the okay, That's just if you really want to do this exercise. You don't really need to do that exercise because you know the physics that the fusion equation does. It takes a spike, smooths it out, and smooths it out, and then it depends on the square root of time. And that's essentially what viscosity does to forces. It makes them just a little bit wider. It makes them a little bit wider in a way which is sort of um, smooth, right? And like the fusion is slow. So most of the time, and I emphasize most of the time, of course, it, it kind of has a very gentle effect uh, on a process. And if you sort of physically want to now try to estimate this L, its length L is basically not going to be if we Imagine generalizing this to a curved filament, but instead of being a line, it's a little tube, and this tube that has a little bit of L. If you want to estimate this to L, you need to know the viscosity. So it's good to know a couple of kilometer viscosities. Uh, <clears throat> probably the most useful one is water, since the answer is 1. So the, the viscosity of water is 1 millimeter squared per second. Okay. It's 1 millimeter squared per second. So after one second, the vortex is going to have a thickness which is one millimeter. In air, it's a factor of whatever it is, 20 usually, right? In gas and water. So in air, 20 millimeters. So if you make a vortex ring out of your box or whatever it is, then the thickness of that vortex, the thickness of region which is kind of has uniform vorticity, therefore is rotating solidly, is going to be uh, whatever the square root of 20. Okay, after one second. So that's kind of two, two numbers which we can think about. So now, if you want to think about whether this law of conduction really applies, it gives you a length scale. Right? You're going to be comparing things like about half a meter or a meter to the length of the vortex to this infinitesimal length scale, which is your one millimeter or a few millimeters. Okay? And so that's a factor of the concept, which is quite nice. It's a problem, which makes it a factor of three. So now you have to worry about it. So that's just sort of way to be good. Um, but it's also kind of really captures uh, a lot of the physics of the uh, vortices and okay. canvas. Okay, I think that's probably uh, not a bad place to stop, but just summarize all that. I hope what we want today is that. Um, you can uh, predict the motion of an arbitrary curved vortex filament okay, uh, by looking at the influence of the part of the part to the point that are uh, sort of relevant but somewhat negligible compared to the prompt influence which the local neighborhood has on the model. And that the strong influence that this local neighborhood has. Okay, uh, makes vortex evolution trivial, it makes it an integrable system 
simple rule, which was you move it proportional to your curvature, um, and on close to close. Um, and as you saw, it works. In qualitative understanding the evolution of real forms, you saw an experiment, so you have a predict problem. Uh, practice, you have to be a little bit careful, and you have to be a little bit careful because in rectal fluids, participant does not stop straight arbitrary points, and it kind of spreads out of the diffusion, and this little spreading out um, gives the tube thickness, apparently a very small thickness compared to its size, it's true, but because the divergence is logarithmic, you sort of can never really forget about this. You always have to kind of keep this at the back of your mind when you interpret it. So next time do is kind of uh, be talking about what happens if you take one of these. Uh, so so one of the things, the pictures which I hope is emerging from all this, right, is that the entire description of how a fluid evolves right, away from boundaries is basically uh, vorticity. So the entire picture comes down to computing the vorticity and using the vorticity to see how a fluid. So the vorticity is really the key to understanding flows uh, away from boundaries when you don't have objects. And so what I want to do next time is we're going to quickly write all the physics of the fluid, the conserved quantities of the fluid in terms of the vorticity, to recover our simple kind of tunic ones, energy, momentum, and momentum, stuff like that. But um, what I want to do next time is to show that when you sort of understand uh, evolution of fluid in terms of vorticity, you can find uh, an additional conserved quantity in a fluid which doesn't really have a clock uh, if you don't have a fluid. It's a conserved quantity which only occurs in sort of uh, ideal fluids, and it could be anything from super fluids to a real fluid to uh, a plasma. And the way in which we can interpret this, this new conserved quantity, which kind of doesn't really come from a symmetry like the ones that you're used to, is in terms of the structure of the vortex lines. We're going to see how if the vortex lines are not even linked, then this zero quantity has not zero an influence on the flow, and if not not the link, then there's no influence on the flow. So we're going to sort of, kind of look at that, we'll look at the idea, and if we have time at the end, I'll show you some experiments in which it's possible to sort of explore these ideas. And if we have time, we'll try to tie it back into all the other fields in which these questions. So that's all. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Is there any question? It's been a long day. So. Yeah, I guess it's, it's like 5 o'clock for you guys or something? Uh, yeah, almost 5 30. Okay, you should go watch the game then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Italy's going to win, right? That's what everybody's going to be hoping, right?